great song, isn't it? Great song of faith. Praise God for that. I hope you've had that victory in Jesus yourself today. You've experienced the love of God in your life. And you've been radically born again. And you know Jesus is your Lord and your Savior. Well, I have to admit, uh, I'm going to brag a little bit. I have a really nice car. I mean, it's beautiful. It's candy red. Candy red. Isn't that good? It's got one of those backup cameras in it. Boy, it looks so good. And you, I don't even have to look behind me when I back out of the driveway. I know I'm supposed to. But it's just easy. It's got the radio. It's got the, the, the CD player. I listen to songs all the time. I listen to the cantata. I've been listening to my solo. Yes. I mean, it has got a beautiful interior. It's comfortable. I could live in that car. I really could. I mean, it's very comfortable, relaxing. The windows are kind of tinted. People can't see me sitting in there studying when I go to the hospital, you know. I hope they can. But it's just such a beautiful car. But the problem is, you got to have a key to start it. And I lost my keys. I don't know where they are. And the car, as beautiful as it is, is as luxurious as it is to me, it's not worth anything to me. Because I don't have the key. I can't start it. I can't get in it. And that's what the scripture is talking about today in Revelation 2. Have you lost something? Have you ever lost something? In verse 1 of Revelation 2, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things say he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works. I know your works. I know what you're doing, God says. And your labor, your patience, and how you cannot bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles and are not. You found them to be liars. You've borne, you've had patience. And for my name's sake, you have labored and have not fainted. But, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly. And will remove thy candlestick out of his place. Except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit say unto the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Have you lost something? Have you lost something important to you? The church of Ephesus had lost something. They left it behind. And they lost it. And it was their first love. The angel speaking, or speaking unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, as he did to the other six churches of Revelation, all located there in, in the uh, western part of Turkey today. They are pictured as having the responsibility of keeping the light burning. That was their job. Their job was to not create the light. They were not the light themselves. But their job was to keep the light burning. That's the job of the church. To keep the fire going. To keep the light shining. And this church was working real hard to do that. But they lost something. The light began to flicker. And God even says right here in a very uh, moving, heart-wrenching scripture. If you don't repent. If you don't change and get those first things back you've lost. I'll come unto you and I'll remove your candlestick. Unless you repent. Now where's the church of Ephesus today? It's gone. 
It's not there anymore. Just rubble left maybe of the building. It's gone. Because they lost their first love. I don't think anybody ever intends to lose their first love. Nobody intends to drift away. Nobody intends to fall away. It just happens gradually. We let one thing go and another thing go and we compromise just a little bit. We kind of sin just a little bit. And next time it becomes easier and easier. And before we know it, we're like the woman I read about in Florida. She and her husband were on some inflatable rafts just relaxing in the sun, getting some sun. And he decided he'd had enough. He brought his raft on in. But she said, I'm going to stay out there. And she just soaked in the sun. And when she looked up sometime later, she had drifted. Miles and miles and miles from the shore. She could barely see it. You talk about a panic. And that's what usually happens. We don't intend to. But we dream. You ever lost something important? What's something important do you think about that that you have lost or misplaced? It's, it's interesting how the Bible refers to lost is not being saved. When you're lost, you're not where you're supposed to be. When you lose your car keys, they're either not where they're supposed to be, or they are where they're supposed to be, but you don't see them. You don't see them. But who lost them? Who's responsible for where they are? Who lost my car keys? Is it your fault? It's mine. I lost them. So I'm the last one that saw them. I'm the last one that put them wherever they are. It's not anybody else's fault. It's mine because I've misplaced them. What have you lost in your life? This church had lost their first love. Do you remember your first love? Do you remember? I'm not talking about girlfriends or boyfriends. Carol was my first love. As a matter of fact, I never loved anybody else. I ran from it. I was scared to death. I had a girl ask me one time at my home church to sit with me that Sunday night and hold hands. And you know what I did? I left that church and went back to college to avoid her. <laughs> scared me to death. Carol's my first and only love. Your first love, do you remember when you got saved? Do you remember the joy you felt? Do you remember the peace? How happy it was? What, Brother Lloyd? Whether your knees are hurting or not, you could have run and done cartwheels, couldn't you? Praise God, the excitement, the joy. Have you lost the joy and the glow of the Christian life? Have you lost your ability to love other people? To forgive people? Have you lost a healthy perspective of yourself? Has the attention turned around away from Christ and now it's only on you and your feelings and what you enjoy doing, your time and your money? Is Christ out of the picture now? Have you lost something very important? Well, let me ask you something. Why? Number two, why is that something important to you? My car keys are very important to me because I cannot get into my nice car without them. I enjoy that car. You might have lost your house key. And inside is your couch, your television, and you want to sit on that couch and relax. You want to go to your kitchen table and eat a dinner. You might have left your money, your wallet, your purse on the table, and all your money, your jewelry's in there in the jewelry box. Your family's and your pets are in there. Your plants need to be watered. You've got a lot invested in that home. It's a, it's a wonderful place you enjoy being. But you've got that big old door there and it's locked. You can't get in. Because you lost the key. That's why it's important. I want you to notice that the church of Revelation, church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, was not a bad church. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of compliments given to this church. 
Look what he says in verse 2. I know your works. I know your labor. I know how patient you are. I know you don't put up with evil. You don't put up with false prophets. You even test those who say they're apostles, but they're not. And you've proven them to be liars. You're theologically sound. You believe in the truth of the Word of God. And you are so patient, he even repeats it. You have patience. And for my name's sake, in the name of Christ, you've kept working, you've labored, and you have not fainted. You've not gotten tired. You've not gotten weary of this. You're as strong as you have ever been on these issues. There's a lot of good. And then he goes on later. He talks about the group called the Nicolaitans who were causing a lot of trouble there in the church. They were false prophets as well. And they were causing a lot of turmoil. And he said, you know, you hate that kind of spirit just like I hate it. You can you imagine that? The church is complimented because you hate the same things I hate, God says. You hate sin. You hate evil just like I do. What a great church. Nevertheless, nevertheless, you've lost your first love. Now, we can be just like that. We're not careful. We can, we can talk about our past. We can talk about all our mission churches we started. We can talk about the glorious revivals. We can talk about the great youth ministries. We can talk about our katanas. We can talk about the food pantry ministry and all the good benevolence work that we do. Man, this church has got a lot of good things going for it. This church is theologically sound. This church believes the truth, stands on the truth. This church believes in serving. But watch out. There's an old saying that goes like this. Remember it. The good is ever the enemy of the best. The good is the enemy of the best. We can settle for being a good church. And that will keep us from becoming the best church that we could be. Oh, we're good enough, Brother Tony. We become infatuated with knowledge instead of holiness. We become comfortable with the Holy Spirit instead of standing in awe of the Holy Spirit. We lose our evangelism, our zeal. When we start looking around at the world as our enemy instead of our mission field, we become insensitive to the Holy Spirit. We become dull to His voice. And the littlest Besetting sins just distract us from serving God. We become content with what we are instead of being driven to become more like Jesus Christ. We allow other things to sit on the throne of our lives. And we relegate Christ to a good place. But it's only good. It's lesser than our place. It's not the best place for Him. It's not His place of importance. And we begin to love something or someone more than we love Jesus Christ. And you know, sometimes if we're not careful, we feed off each other. And that's a good thing if you're feeding good off of each other. But when someone you're hanging around has lost their first love, and they're bitter, or they're unforgiving, or they've compromised their value, and they step back in the world, and, and you're close to them, you spend a lot of time with them, guess what's probably going to happen to you? So much wrong with you're going to start drifting without realizing it. We sat down uh, to eat. We went to Knott County last night, and we went into the mall, Brother Larry, John Priest's place. We ate at that restaurant. And uh, they were closing early, they said, for maintenance. So there was only me and Carol and Robert. Uh, an older couple came in and a man sitting by himself. And you know what everybody was saying? We were watching, I forget who we were watching, some other team on the ball game. Georgia. Yeah, we were watching Georgia and Tennessee. And it went off. They kept telling the waitress. And she tried to find it. And we, then Robert went up. And finally I went up. And I said... It's not on all these channels. It's, it's on, I think, 27 on the cable. They had cable over there. 
when we found the end. Guess what we all talked about? Guess what brought us all together? We were talking about UK and wanting to see the game. It united us. You will be influenced by the people you hang out with. You will become interested in the things they like, and you will be against the things they don't like. Whether you really believe it, whether it's the core of your values or not, if you're not careful, you will go along and you will drift away with the people that you are hanging around. There's an old sea captain. This was years ago. He was riding on a train. There was a young man there who was going to Philadelphia for a job interview. And back in those days, you had to take letters with you, you know. And he said, do you have your letters? And he said, yes. And he showed him all of his letters. He said, what about your, your church membership letter? He said, oh, I've got that too, but I didn't think you'd want to see that. And that old captain said, oh, yes. That's the most important one of all. He said, as soon as you get to a new town, if you move there, the first thing you need to do is unite with the church. You need to unite with the body of Christ because that's what you're going to become like. Where do you go? That old sea captain told that man, he said, you know what? I've sailed all around this world and I've sailed my ship into many a harbors. And he said, I pay, I pay, quote, park it in the harbor. He says, I have to pay some wharfage, but it's a whole lot better than letting my boat sit out there in the ocean and drift about. What a great point. What a great point. Are we content just to drift about? Are we going to anchor with the body of Christ and fall in love with the works of the church? Oliver Cromwell, you remember that. This was way back before the British were redcoats. And Oliver Cromwell had a group working for him, fighting for him called the Ironsides. And, and they would often skirmish with different people. And one day they were skirmishing with the Cavaliers. And Cromwell realized that his own men, his own iron fights, were sometimes accidentally stabbing their own men because they couldn't tell them apart from the enemy. So Cromwell said, you know what we're going to do? We're all going to wear red coats. And he demanded his men come in red coats so they could tell the enemy apart. Do you know what? Christ is calling for us to wear red coats. He's calling for us, in other words, to identify with Christ. Not to be ashamed of Him. There will never be a secret Christian in heaven. Only those who profess Christ. If we deny Him, He'll deny us. And so put on the coat. And Cromwell, here's what he said. He said, you wear red coats, all of you. We must know our men from the enemy. He says, now that you are Christ, and, and Charles Spurgeon used this in his sermon. Here's what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, now that you are Christ, do not go about as if you were ashamed of His majesty's service. Put on your red coats. And he says, I mean, come out and acknowledge Christians. Unite with a body of Christian people and be distinctly known to be Jesus Christ. And that's what Charles Spurgeon said in his sermon. We need to step up and identify where we stand with Jesus. Well, you've lost something. Maybe it's the first love. Many Christians have lost their first love. They've lost the joy of serving God. They're not in love with Him anymore. And you know what? They want it back. Oh, what we'd give to go back and be that way again the day we got saved. Oh, it'd be wonderful, that feeling. I could never describe to you what I felt like that day in February 1973. When I felt the burden of sin lift off of me, the joy came over me. There's nothing I can describe it with. But well, would you love to go back to those days? Well, let me ask you one more question. What can you do to get that something back? What do you do? What's the first thing you do when you lose something? You go looking for it. Don't you? Yes. You lost your car keys. You go out to get your car. Oh, I don't have my car keys. You go back in the house. You start looking. That's the first thing you do. You will tear your house apart. You'll tear your car apart if you can get into it looking for those keys. That's the first thing I did. I looked everywhere that I possibly could have laid my keys. 
where I normally lay them. I asked everybody, you got my keys? No, never not seen it. I looked in places that it shouldn't have been. Behind dressers, places it could have gotten hidden, places I knew I never put it. But I searched diligently because I wanted it back. There's a fellow on the internet, he's got his own website. He's a magician, actually. A graduate in English from Harvard University, but what he's most known as, his name is Professor Solomon. I wonder where he got that name from. Professor Solomon. What he's most known for is he is a findologist. A findologist. In other words, he's an expert at finding lost objects. Get on his website and look him up. He's been on ABC's Good Morning America. He's been on the NPR radio. He's been on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in a, in a show, a documentary called Lost and Found. And, you know, he's, he's helped people find many objects they lost by taking them back to the customary places uh, where they are. But here's what it says on his website. It says the reality is that they aren't always returned there. Instead, they are left wherever last used. He says, think back. You were at the scene of the misplacement. You were there when the object was put down. When it was left in an obscure location where it was consigned to oblivion. He says, you were there because you did it. And you have a memory, however faint it might be, of where this happened. It's where it's supposed to be. You know what? My keys are probably exactly where they're supposed to be. It's just a matter of me searching to find it. You've left your keys. You've lost them. You've left your first love. You've lost it. So what does he say to do? And he's got a whole long list of things. But here's the three that really grabbed my attention that he, he mentioned in his website. Remember where you last had it. Go back and remember where you last had it. Reenact it. I remember watching Gilligan one day. He lost something. And they told him to go back where he was to try to find it. Reenact it. As the third one says, retrace your steps. So he comes out of the jungle one day and he's saying, I found it! I found it! They said, you found it? He said, no, but that's what I cried the first time I found it. So I'm reenacting. <laughs> Remember where you last had it. Where was your love? Was it in church? Were you in a Bible study? Were you listening to some praise and worship music? Were you praying with a group of friends? Were you praying with your family around the kitchen table? Were you serving in a ministry of the church, were you on a mission trip when you were so in love with the Lord? What do you do? You look for it. You remember, where did I last have it? Go back there. Where did you first last have your love for the Lord? Go back to that place today. How do you go back to it? That's the second one. To reverse your directions. Or in other words, as the Bible calls it, repent. Repent. When I got to my car and I didn't have my keys, you know the first thing I did? I turned around. I reversed my direction. I could have stood in my driveway all day looking at the gravel and I would not have found it. I had to repent. I had to turn around and go back and start looking. Have you been careless? You know what? I learn my lesson when I lose things. At least I try to learn my lesson. I think all of us think we learn our lesson, but we do it again, don't we? But what I should have done, if I really repented, that when I find my keys I lost, I should say to myself, okay, from now on, I'm going to put them in the particular place where I always know they are. I'm going to have a system. I'm going to come up with a way to prevent this from ever happening again. I need a test. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful if we did that? In our faith as well. I want to go back to where I knew Christ. I'm going to go back to the roots. I'm going to go back to that day I was saved. But this time I'm going to put a system in place. 
I'm going to make sure I'm around God's people, that I'm in His Word, that I'm in prayer, that I'm serving, and I'm not going to lose it again. And if it starts to feel like I'm drifting away, I'm going to know where to go to find it. You retrace your steps. You go back. You look everywhere you had been before you lost it. I like this. Somebody said, you read your Bible now with eager eyes. You pray about everything. You enjoy God's presence. You give without begrudging. You serve with compassion. You praise God for His wonderful grace that saved you. You go back. And so I did that. I went back everywhere I could to find my car keys. And you know where I found them? Exactly where I put them. Guess where they were? Hanging in the closet in my coat. It was right where it was supposed to be. It's where I put it. It wasn't lost. I just left it. And today, Christ isn't lost. Your first love isn't lost. You just left it. And you know what you can do today? You can come home. You can come back and rediscover. You can return to your first love for the Lord. Because of His wonderful grace and mercy. Because He shed His blood to pay the price for your sins. He stands with open arms and He says, I've got what you've lost. I've got what you've left. Come back to it today. Return to me. Repent and come back. If you don't, I may remove your candlestick. You won't have a light to shine anymore. If you don't return. There was a pastor, a Presbyterian pastor at a conference. His name was Dr. Bob Munger. He was pastor for many years at the First Presbyterian Church in Berkeley, California. One day at a pastor's conference, he stood up and he had a large poster, pretty much as big as this screen right here. And right in the middle of it, he had drawn a big X. And he said, here was my life when I got saved. I was right in the middle of the will of God for my life. He says, now sometimes, and he drew another X way on the periphery, on the side. He says, sometimes I found myself drifting. And then he put another X on the outside of the box. He says, sometimes I drifted pretty far where I thought I wasn't even God's anymore. But I was. He said, and all the time when I drifted, I looked at that X in the middle and I'd come back to it. Come back to it. If you had a big poster to write on today and the very center X was you being perfectly in God's will, where would your X be? Where would your X be? Be on the side? Be outside in the square? Jesus is calling us back today. Come back to the center. Come back to your first love. Rekindle that. How do you do that? You search for it. You go looking for it. Christ is there. He's never left you. My keys never left me. I left them. Christ has never left you. You've only left Him. You can come back right where He's supposed to be. You can find it today. Would you pray with me? Right now, Heavenly Father, I know through your Holy Spirit, you're speaking to somebody. Somebody, Lord, they feel like the X is way out of the box in their life. They feel like maybe they've drifted. And they know deep inside, oh, they want to come home. Lord, assure them today that that grace is there. That you're standing like you did the prodigal son out there looking waiting for them to come home. And if your child comes home today, God, you'll receive them with open arms. And God, if there's someone that has never known Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, never had that joy and peace, give them that first love today. Let them fall in love with you like I did in 1973. 
God to call and speak to their heart, tug on and let them feel the Holy Spirit of God and know that it is God drawing them today. Come to me and I will give you rest. Oh God, draw us today back into your presence. Help us to search, Lord. If you seek me and search me with all your heart, you'll find me, God said. God, help us to repent, to turn around and go back to where we misplaced that first love. Help us to retrace our steps, Lord. And get back into church. Get back with the people of God. Get back to serving you. And get back to your word. Get back to prayer. Help us to fall in love with you again today. And as this invitation is open, Lord, if there's anyone here who feels God speaking to them, let them come today and make a decision. Whether it's to give their life to Jesus for the first time or to recommit their life to Christ and come home. Or maybe they want to come and just pray at the altar. Join the church. Be baptized. Whatever your Holy Spirit is saying to them today, Lord. Help us to listen. To do what you say. So we don't have to go away from here today. Still looking for the lost. Help us, Lord, today to rediscover the one who's never moved, who's always where he was, and that is Jesus. And I pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. If you've lost something, you come today. God will restore it to you.